Um, and here, I'll talk a little bit more about the Music Lab, um, but more in the context of emphasizing uh, zero variable cost experiments. Experiments that have these high fixed costs and low variable costs, and what kinds of things that helps you accomplish. OK, so. Uh, so now we're going to really talk about experiments at scale. So there's this thing. I was, at, um, I was at Stanford recently, and we talked to people about what they're working on, and they would say, I'm working on such and such at scale. And like, no matter what they said, there was always at scale at the end. <laughs> um, and so this is going to be about experiments at scale. Um, and because to me, this is really one of the things that's most different, um, is the ability to do really, really large experiments. And I think it's one of the most exciting parts of it, because with these really, really large experiments, we can potentially do stuff that no one has ever done before, and no one has even ever thought about before. Like, if you ha can do a really, really large experiment, and you end up just doing the same thing everyone else has done, a hundred times, that's a real failure of imagination. So try to think more about like what is now possible that was not possible before. And I'll give a concrete example of that. So again, this is the way to think about cost scaling and analog experiments. They're relatively easy to start. Uh, they have a low uh, fixed cost. And then if you want to double your experiment, you need roughly twice as much money. If you want to 10x your experiment, you need 10 times as much money. Um, here's what digital experiments look like. And again, this picture we see over and over and over again. And this, I think, comes up all over. But I think it's very important in experiments as well. So like for Music Lab, <clears throat> there was a high fixed cost. And then there was zero variable cost. And so. <clears throat> What that allowed us to do is run experiments with 27,000 people, um, which, like, let's imagine we got every single undergrad at Duke to be in the experiment. How many undergrads are there at Duke? Like 5,000? 5,000. Not enough. Let's imagine we got <clears throat> everyone at Duke and everyone in their family. That's, like, probably. Still not 27,000. Like 27,000 is a lot. I know that we're used to thinking on Facebook experiments have 100 million people or whatever. 27,000 people is a lot of people. And the only reason that is possible is because of this. And the other thing is that we didn't just take experiments that people had run before and do them 100 times. We tried to do something qualitatively different. So I want to talk here a little bit first about how to get this zero variable cost in your experiments, how you can create these experiments. And then um, also to think some about what are the ethical implications of this. Because I'm going to teach you how to do something, and you could then potentially misuse what I'm going to teach you. So I want to warn you about that possible misuse. Um, so in the main sources of variable costs in experiments, I think are staff time and participant payment. So if you think about a Psych 101 experiment, which is kind of can be our sort of baseline for comparison, there usually is a person in that room with the participant, a grad student who is there to like greet the person and check them in. Uh, that is expensive. Graduate students are expensive. Um, and you have to pay the participants to do it because they generally wouldn't just show up and do it on their own. So what if we could eliminate both of those costs? So we can automate the experiment so that it can run while we're sleeping. And we can design enjoyable experiments that people actually want to be in. And so if you're able to do automation, you eliminate the need for staff time. And if you're able to design enjoyable experiments, you eliminate the need for payments. So once you have an enjoyable, fully automated experiment, you get zero variable cost. So we talked some about building bots. That's a way that you can start to think about automation. Um, a lot of websites completely run on their own without human involvement. That's another way to create automation. 
So in Music Lab, um, let me tell you about what we did. And you'll see these themes of automation and enjoyableness in the experiment. I also want to be totally clear. I wasn't like thinking about this at the time. It wasn't like I was like thinking about this picture at the time. This is all stuff that had become clear to me much later. Um, I think implicitly this stuff was, we were thinking about it, but it certainly wasn't explicit. Um, so this is a project that I did with Duncan Watts, who was a speaker uh, a few days ago. He was my advisor. Uh, Peter Dodds was involved in this project, as was Peter Housel, who was a web developer we worked with. So this is also, uh, there was a designer. Peter Housel did not make this uh, cool picture. Uh, so we also had someone named Jason Burr Jennings who helped us with the graphical design. Because the first thing that Peter made did not look cool. As, <laughs> as Peter would totally acknowledge as well. Um, so this is the website that people saw. Uh, they visited musiclab.columbia.edu. So you can see that it's very clearly labeled as a something related to Columbia. So you can, this is Columbia Blue. We have the university logo. It's hosted on a university website. So it's clear to people that they're in a research study. After people clicked here, um, then they um, completed a consent form. They took a short survey where we collected some basic demographic information about them. And then they were taken to a page that looked kind of like this. These are 48 songs from up and coming artists. A key feature about this design is that these bands are all unknown to the participants. So we wanted to have these bands be essentially blank slates where then we could control all the information people have about them. So if you imagine at the time Britney Spears was very popular and Justin Timberlake was very popular, he is actually still pretty popular too. That's pretty impressive. Um, <laughs> Uh, so if you put Britney Spears and Justin Timberlake's music into this experiment, people come with all kinds of stuff about them. Here, these are bands like Stunt Monkey, Not For Scholars, Parker Theory. These are bands that you have not heard of. Um, and if you had been around in 2004, you would have not heard of them as well. Um, this was actually an interesting sampling challenge of trying to find high quality good music that was essentially unknown to participants. So we got these bands. All of the bands agreed to have their music in the study. And in part, this was for increasing exposure. But also, we gave them back market research. So what you'll see is people are going to interact with these songs and rate them and download them. And we have some demographic information. And so for each of the bands, we said, we'll get you some more exposure. And we'll send you a report about how people are interacting with your music. Yep. Yeah. So the bands, there is a website um, called purevolume.com, uh, which was a place where unsigned bands posted their music. So we took a sample of um, these bands and contacted them. And, the, one, and uh, the ones that agreed to participate were in there. So they were aware of what we were doing. And we, and we as I said, gave them exposure and also gave them these marketing reports. Um, we also did a number of screens on pure volume to eliminate bands that participants might have heard of. So we eliminated bands that had played. So we had talked to, while I was doing this, I ended up talking to a bunch of people who knew about indie music, which I certainly did not when I started. Uh, and so like, I asked, like, what's a good way to figure out if a band is well known? And they said, if they've played in more than 10 states, that's a good sign that they're pretty well known. So on a lot of their pure volume pages, they list their gigs. And so we would take them out if they've played in more than 10 states. If they've played in certain music festivals, like South by Southwest, that's a sign that they're pretty popular. You should take them out, and so on, and so on, and so on. So there's a screening process and then a consent process. Yep. No. So this is actually it's an interesting thing. So usually when you design an experiment, you kind of set all the parameters of the experiment. Uh, in this case, the parameter was set by nature, which is like whatever was on purevolume.com, that's what we got. And so what you'll see is there is, uh, well, let me add one more thing about the pure volume. So if you just look at all the songs, there's a lot of just like really bad music. And I, I don't believe in like objective quality in music. I mean, like 
very poor recording, just like gar junky. So we limited ourselves to bands that were paying $10 a month to have their music. They get extra features on pure volume. So that is not a super high bar, but it rules out people that are you know, not at all serious about what they're doing. And so of these bands that pay $10 a month, there's a big variety in quality, and there's a big variety in genre. And the, the big variety in attractiveness of the music is actually a parameter that I now think has an impact on what we found. I didn't think about it at the time. And so you could imagine doing a version of this experiment where you um, adjust the composition of the music in different ways. But in this case, it was sort of set by nature. Yeah? Ah. Yeah. Yeah, so how do we decide if they were high quality music? So we didn't want to be in making that decision in the same way that like with Kitten War, we don't want to decide what kittens are cute. We want to let other people decide. So this was a very crude process of just listening to stuff that was on there and then saying, okay, of the people that are paying $10 a month, these sound like they're well recorded. So there's a lot of music here that I do not like at all. Uh, but it was like well recorded. Yeah. But we didn't get into micromanaging each specific thing. We basically said, have you play, are you paying $10 a month? Then of the ones that are paying $10 a month, uh, have you played in more than 10 states? We're going to get rid of you. Have you played in certain festivals? We're going to get rid of you. Then everyone else, we're going to take a random sample. Um, and then we're going to contact you. And if you consent, you'll be in. And most of the bands that we reached agreed to participate. There were a few that, a very small number that didn't. Um, and there were a number that we couldn't actually reach. But generally, bands who are paying $10 a month are really excited to get emails from people. So they're like, oh, you want to do stuff with our music? That's great. So generally, the responses were very fast and very positive. Yeah. Yes, there's absolutely, there's absolutely heterogeneity of the music, and I will, I'll talk a little bit more about how I think that might have impacted the results. Um, so after you clicked on a song, you, it started to play. I want to also say this page, this took a lot of work to design. I know it looks like kind of natural, but like Jason did a lot of work to figure out how we could put so much information on the page and make it easy for a user. This was not, it didn't just happen. Um, OK, so then we click and it starts to play. Um, and then you're asked to rate it on a scale of one to five stars. Just also, technically, this thing about streaming the audio, we were very worried about if we could make this work successfully. Turns out we, we were able to, but at the time, this was like a non-trivial technical thing. Um, so you're asked to rate it on a scale of one to five stars. Then after you rate it, you have the opportunity to download it or not. And so the way we set up the experiment, we sort of, I think, um, focused people's attention on this decision. Like we're interested in understanding how people respond to music. And I think many of the participants thought that this was the decision that we were interested in. And this was kind of like the reward. But this was the decision we were actually very interested in. Because here we have a very strong behavioral signal that you actually like the song. So whether you say, oh, one to five, OK. But if you actually choose to download the song, that's a very strong signal of your actual interest. So at this time, I think this highlights something that you see some a difference in experimentation in different fields. I think certain fields like psychology tend to be more willing to accept reported behavior or like what people say. And people in economics, for example, tend to be much more focused on what people do. And so here, we're definitely focused on what people are doing. Although, in the analysis, we see huge convergence between what people say and what people do. Um, then you're taken back here. And you're, again, given the choice to rate, uh, listen to, rate, and download as many songs as you want. So what the participants did not see is that behind them, there was an experimental design that was going on. 
And some of the people were randomly assigned. Let me explain why this design was going on. Because actually, I realized this whole talk, we didn't talk about the actual research motivations of what was happening. I was so focused on zero variable cost. Um, OK, so what were the research motivations? Um, it actually goes to a theme that we've discussed a lot here, which is unpredictability. Um, and so we were really interested in things like Harry Potter. So that was very popular around then. And actually, Nora Jones was also very popular around then. OK, so the, uh, Harry Potter, um, incredibly popular, sells uh, millions of copies around the world, translated into more than 60 languages. That would make you think that Harry Potter is somehow special, or better than all the other books, or at least somehow different. But that difference was not at all clear ahead of time to the publishing executive. So Harry Potter was rejected by eight publishers before it was finally picked up. And it turns out that stories like this are very, very common, where you see huge success and also a lot of inability of experts to identify those things, failures of prediction. Um, and more generally, it turns out that in the market for books, music, movies, art, and TV shows, you see two general patterns. One is you see huge variation in success. These are sometimes called winner-take-all markets or superstar markets. And at the same time, you see tremendous unpredictability in who will become successful. Um, and so like in movies, the screenwriter William Goldman says, nobody knows anything. And so it seems strange that these two things would co-occur, that you would simultaneously see huge variation in success and tremendous unpredictability. And so what we were trying to do is figure out if both of these collective level outcomes could arise from the same individual level process. And so that was the argument that we were making, that social influence, that people being influenced by what other people are doing, can create a process of cumulative advantage where successful things become more successful. And you can see how that leads to big variation in success and how success leading to more success creates superstars. But also that success leading to more success can also create unpredictability. Because sometimes one thing would become popular. And then if we could rewind history and play it again, a different thing could become popular. So this argument may be compelling to you, but only if you do not like Harry Potter. So everyone who likes Harry Potter <clears throat> is totally convinced that Harry Potter was destined for greatness. Um, and the challenge is that like, for Harry Potter, let's say, that one piece of data is completely consistent with the idea that Harry Potter is great. And it's completely consistent with the idea that Harry Potter is lucky. And so to see the role of chance, we really need to see multiple outcomes of the same process. So imagine if we could rewind the world to the day that Harry Potter was first released and make eight copies of the world and have them all evolve independently. So if Harry Potter was popular in all of those, then we would say, OK, it's good. If it was popular in one, but not the others, then we would say it's lucky. So that's kind of a thought experiment. And we can't actually, like, actually rewind the world. Even with the biggest grant from the Russell Sage Foundation, we cannot do that. Um, so what we were trying to do in, but we can do something like that in an online experiment, where we can create these parallel histories, and we can compare these parallel histories when people are interacting with each other and see what other people are doing, compared to a history where everyone is um, behaving independently. And so this way, we can isolate the effect of social influence on inequality and unpredictability of success. So how did the participants interact with each other? Did they see the ratings of songs or? So the way the information that participants had about uh, the other songs was the download counts. So I want to say something about this design also, because I presented this in a psychology department. And someone asked, well, where did those download counts come from? And I said, they came from our database. And they're like, no, 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 but how did you pick them? And I'm like, oh, we didn't pick them. They just like counted up how many times the things are actually downloaded. And they're like, you mean you didn't like fake the download counts? And I'm like, no, this is just actually, we sort of set this system up and let it evolve naturally. 
So I want to emphasize this is a bad design for studying social influence at the individual level. It's actually, it's very hard to understand, given the way that we've set this up, why exactly people are doing what they're doing, how do we disentangle certain mechanisms involved in social influence, but that is not the goal to understand individual level social influence. The goal is to understand what are the aggregate consequences when people are following what other people are doing. So another way to think about it is we are, if, if you think about like, I like to think about um, what, so sometimes people ask, what is sociology? Um, and so I sometimes say sociology is about packs of dogs. And then they say, what are you talking about? Uh, and so I'd say that you can think about um, an individual dog, and we can like ring a bell, and we can study if that can teach, we can train the dog to salivate when we ring a bell and do all this stuff about studying individual dogs. And we can study those individual dogs by themselves in great detail. Um, but when we put those dogs together into a pack, new behavior emerges. And so I think as a sociologist, I'm generally interested in packs of dogs, not individual dogs. So we are not really isolating the precise things that are going on inside of people's heads as they make these decisions. We are instead trying to understand what the aggregate implications are for things like success and unpredictability, which are not the properties of any individual. They're the properties of the aggregation of many people's decisions. OK, many, okay good. Many questions? I mean, is, uh, isn't it a problem that maybe actually these counts, they are highly correlated with the goodness of ah, songs? Ah, great question. Because I feel like yep. it's, so what I mean by this, yep. uh, it kind of helps people, so probably people who, who started to use this website a lot, they actually understand things about music, yes? And so that helps them. So maybe these counts, they kind of, uh, they kind of trigger, trigger their interest, but they don't really like... Yeah, so, so one question might be, maybe these counts actually don't lead to increased unpredictability. Maybe they lead to increased predictability. So maybe there's just some good songs in here and some bad songs. And by showing the popularity, you're just going to help people find the best songs faster. So there's a lot of times where we think, like, wisdom of the crowds. Let's make information about what other people are doing available so people can learn from the behavior of others. So maybe this is actually going to lead to increased predictability. And we'll see what happens in a second. Other questions? Natalie, yeah? Are you about to explain what the eight worlds were? Yes, I'm about to explain what the eight worlds were. OK. Uh, let me explain what the eight worlds were. Um, OK. So participants uh, came to the website, and they were randomly assigned into one of these conditions. In the independent condition, they saw exactly what you just saw, but without the download count information. And so this is a world of people making decisions independently. Um, this behavior of people in this condition also gives us a great way to measure the, the, the appeal of these songs. So you notice I almost said quality, but I didn't say quality. So let me say why I didn't say quality. Um, because um, I don't really believe in, in objective quality. I think that attractiveness of artistic things is like a property of the object and a property of the receiver. So like if I like Jay-Z and you like Beethoven, like I don't want to have a discussion about which is higher quality. I'm just happy to know if Beethoven is high appeal to you and Jay-Z is high appeal to me and we can just all be happy with that. Um, so a lot of studies about these cultural products, they run into this problem that they can't really measure the appeal or quality. So they try to say experts, give expert ratings and stuff. And I think that's like bogus. So what we were doing here is we were having the people in this pool of participants acting independently whether they download these songs or not. And so then we can say, for this group of people who are mostly American teenagers, these particular songs are very appealing, and these particular songs are not appealing. And if we run the experiment with a different group of people, which in fact we did, we ran it with an older and more international group, they found different songs appealing. That's fine. So this condition gives us a measure of the appeal of the song, which I think is um, much better than measures that are based on experts. Um, 
then people were also assigned randomly, some people were into these social influence conditions, and then they were further assigned into one of these eight worlds. And so what would happen is you would see the download count in your world, but you wouldn't see anything about what was happening in the other world. So imagine you go into, there's like eight uh, sort of dorm rooms. You go into one of the dorm rooms, you see what's happening in your room, but not in the other rooms. And then we can see to what extent these worlds with indistinguishable groups of participants evaluating the same 48 songs with the same initial conditions of zero downloads, to what extent these evolve similarly or to what extent these sort of parallel histories diverge. So I want to also say that we did two versions. We actually did four experiments, but I'm going to talk about two main versions that we did. So in one version, we had less social influence. So by presenting the songs in this way, the popularity of the songs was available, but it wasn't particularly salient. Um, in this second condition, we sorted the songs by popularity. So we dramatically increased the amount of social influence. So what we're doing here is we're manipulating this individual level process, and then we want to see what effects that have on group outcomes. Now, I want to talk one second about why we need so many participants, because each outcome is the result of a group now, not an individual person. And so in these first two experiments, we had 14,000 people, because each world had about 700 people. And so if you want to have 700 people to produce one data point, you're going to need a lot of people. Uh, yeah, Hussein? Yeah. Uh, yep, yep, good question. OK, so um, these, e within each experiment, it was done in, uh, at the same time. Because what we were worried about is, so traffic on websites can sometimes be heterogeneous and bursty. So for example, if we got link, so we were also out trying to get links on like music blogs, and we're trying to get coverage in the newspaper, and we're trying to do all this stuff to get people to come to this website. And so let's imagine we get on this cool indie music blog, and then we have 100 people or show up at one time, and they all get put into world one. And then we have this, like, we get in USA Today, and that's like a very different group of people. And then, then they all show up in world two. Then they're not really the same. So these are all happening simultaneously to ensure that the worlds were the same, even if there is heterogeneity in the arrivals. Let me talk about one of the challenges this creates, though, is how many worlds should we have? So we were like, we want to have as many worlds as we can, of course, but we don't know how long it's going to take for these popularities to stabilize. And we don't know even how many people we're going to recruit. So this was a, a very hard uh, process. Uh, basically, we did a pilot test um, to check and make sure the website worked correctly, and also to get a little bit of data. And then we ran some simulations. And then we kind of made a guess about how many people we could recruit. And that's sort of how we ended up with eight. Uh, but that was not in any way like optimized. It was just like us kind of trying to figure out what was possible. But it has this weird property that also, actually, this is something we talked about during the coffee break. How do you know when to stop? Um, and so we didn't even know how long it would take to stop because we had no idea how long it would take for the popularity of these songs to sort of stabilize. OK, so what did we, oh yeah, so we did these two experiments. Um, so this is what, the, I, what we found. All right, so there's a lot going on here. So, this is the first experiment where we had less social influence, right here. So the x-axis here is the market share in the independent world. This is a measure of the market share is of all the downloads, what proportion of the downloads went to that song. Um, the y-axis here is then the market share in each of the social influence worlds. Um, so for example, this song here, this is she Said by Parker Theory. And it's a really good song. Um, and you can see that uh, for the eight different worlds, there are eight different market shares. So I want you to first look at this plot. And what you'll see is a couple patterns. So one you see is there's some inequality and in success. Some songs are more popular than others, but not a huge amount. 
There's also some unpredictability in the sense of variation across here. So this kind of variation is kind of fundamental variation. It is like not resolvable. Even if you have perfect information about the appeal of the song, that you can't possibly make this prediction. So uh, because there's just inherent variability. In the same way, you can't predict what's going to happen if you roll a fair die. Uh, you just can't. It's inherent unpredictability. So this is what we saw in the first experiment. Then we cranked up the amount of social influence. And we wanted to see if this would increase the inequality of success, which it does. You see there's much greater variability in the popularity of the songs. And it also increases the unpredictability of success. So the variability for any particular song gets potentially bigger, but not uniformly bigger. So while I was doing this, I want to actually, this is, so while I was doing this, I talked to a lot of people who knew about um, stuff I didn't know about. And I think that's really valuable. So people who are not professors. Uh, so I want to emphasize the value of that. So the whole idea of unpredictability being a thing in music, I learned that from my barber. So I was living in New York, and this um, anyway, my friend had this barber who cut people's hair in her apartment. It was like she was like into music, and like so I was talking to her about my dissertation naturally, and we were talking about the you know inequality of success, and I was like, why are some songs so much more popular than others? Like, what is going on with Nora Jones? And she was like, well, you know that no one has any idea that Nora Jones is going to be popular. And I'm like, oh, come on. Surely they knew, right? Nora Jones is great. She's like, no, no. Like, no one knows. Like, when I worked at a record company, most of what we did failed. And like, I was like, really? And she's like, oh, yeah, everybody knows that. I'm like, wow, that's great. I didn't know that. And so then I went back, and I looked more in the academic literature. And I was like, oh, actually, people have written about this before. This like is a big thing. I just didn't know. Anyway, so um, I thank Juliana for helping inspire my district. Juliana was my barber. Um, the second thing is that um, once we started having results, then I had stuff that I could talk about with other people. And so I showed this result to um, someone who is the head of research at NBC. So NBC is a major television network in the US. and. Um, so I walked into his office. He has a beautiful office. Like, it's great. Uh, great view. And I was like, OK, this is, I explained the experiment. This is what we did. This is what we found. And he said, oh, I knew that. And I'm like, you knew this? He's like, yeah, I knew that. I'm like, well, what did you know? And he's like, well, I can predict failure, but I can't predict success. And so I think that is the most beautiful way of summarizing what is happening here. So for the songs that are low appeal, they pretty much never do well. But for the songs that have high appeal, a huge range of outcomes is possible. So it's not that there is this, you know, we talk about unpredictability, but it's much more subtle that there's really a lot of unpredictability for a subset of the songs. And for other songs, there's actually quite a bit of predictability that it won't do very well. Um, so I think that's a great way of thinking about what's happening here. And it's consistent with some of the stuff that Sendel talked about yesterday, about thinking about variability and the ability to do prediction across different ranges of people. Yeah? What's market share? Like, how is it exactly? Uh, so the market share is the total number of downloads for that song in that world divided by the total number of downloads in that world. Yeah, Mally? So there's two things that are happening. Um, so how, if you think about how a song gets a download, there's two choices. So first, people have to decide what to listen to. And then given that they listen, they have to decide whether to download it or not. So the final outcome is a result of these two choices. So that makes it actually very hard to, we all, right? So we observe both of them, but it, in some ways, it's very hard to understand this second choice because people have selected in in the first step. But what I will say is we've done a number of things. And my guess as to what is happening, which is not 100% rock solid, is that most of what was happening is driven by the listening decisions and not the probability of download given listen. 
So in other words, when people think about social influence on choices, they often think about, imagine a world where you're in a bookstore and you're holding a book called Bit by Bit Social Research in the Digital Age, which is currently available in all your bookstores. And you're like, wow, this is a great book. And you've heard that it was a great book, and so social influence would impact whether you're going to buy that book or not. But I think the much bigger effect is on what people even choose to consider. And that is a property of a lot of these markets for cultural products where there's choice overload. There's just too many things. And so given the enormous number of things, social influence plays a big role in what we even consider. And that highlights actually a second un sort of un hidden parameter in the design of the experiment, which is the number of songs. So we talked about the distribution of quality of the songs being a hidden parameter. So why did we have 48 songs? So the answer of why we had 48 songs is that that's the most songs we could fit on a screen without having scrolling in this design in experiment one. So this is not a scientific reason exactly. Uh, <clears throat> and now, after doing the experiment, I think if we had had 4,800 songs, I think the unpredictability would have been much, much bigger, actually. Um, so even so, th this is, I think, another um, example of a hidden parameter in what we did. Yeah, do you have a question, Doug? Does that then suggest that the choice set was much smaller? You might not observe unpredictability? Like, yes. Let's say I also think if you go the opposite direction, because essentially one way to think about it very crudely, this two-step process. And so there's the listening, the listening decision. I think that's where a lot of the social influence is happening. And then there's the download decision, which I think is affected a lot by the appeal of the songs. And so if, this, if the amount of social influence on the listening decision goes away because you can listen to all the songs, then the song attractiveness is going to dominate. If there's a lots of stuff happening here, then this is going to dominate over this. And so we happen to end up with one combination of these be, we, with 48 songs, with the distribution of appeal of songs that were you know, on, pure, <coughs> on pure volume at that time. And so I think you can see different ways of balancing these two forces if you had done slightly different versions of this experiment. Okay. Yeah. So so yeah. So so one question is: Were there geographic differences? So we don't know, but we do know. So we talked about. Um, the advantage of, of low variable cost experiments for dealing with questions about external validity. So as we were doing this, many people were concerned, oh, these are just American teenagers. American teenagers are particularly susceptible to social influence, perhaps. Um, <clears throat> and so we completely replicated the study with a different pool of participants and got, in aggregate, very similar results. So if I showed you the plot from experiment three, it would look kind of like this, but there is an important difference. Which songs were in which spots were different, but the overall distribution of the market was the same. So it also highlights the fact that there are certain social processes that change the distribution of reward, like the amount of inequality in society. And then there are other processes which can shape who goes into which spot in that distribution. And those are things that can be, those are different things and different mechanisms can be at work there. OK, so uh, this is, again, a number of decisions we made when designing Music Lab enabled it to be zero variable cost. So rather than paying people to do some task, we decided to make a task that was enjoyable, giving them free music. Now, by the way, this also I don't think would work as well today, because people are kind of awash in free music it's, uh, at the time, though. Downloading music from the internet was kind of cool. Um, that was a long time ago. Some of you might not even weren't even alive then, maybe. Um, and uh, so, like the strategies that you will use to make something enjoyable will evolve as society evolves. Um, 
And here, zero variable cost was a means to do these really large experiments, which allowed us to have these group outcomes. And it wasn't just an end in itself. Like we weren't using free music because it was cheaper. We were using it because it enabled us to do something different. So I want to talk a little bit now about what um, can go wrong in zero variable cost experiments. Because, or not wrong, but how they're not really zero variable cost. They're not zero cost. They're zero cost to you, which is different than zero cost. So this is a study by some psychologists. Uh, and what they did is they sent professors emails kind of like this. Um, dear, I did not get this, but this was the contents of the email. Dear Professor Salganik, I am writing to you because I'm a pr prospective PhD student with considerable interest in your research. I'm going to be visiting campus. Uh, I know it's short notice, uh, but I'm wondering. I'm going to be visiting campus today. I wonder if you might have 10 minutes to meet with me to talk about my work. Sincerely, Carlos Lopez. Okay. So um, many of you may have a sense of what is going on here. Um, so there's two things that they varied in this design. Um, one is the name of the person sending you the email. And the other is the timing. So whether you're able to meet today or whether you're able to meet next week. And so what they're doing is measuring to the extent to which uh, professors are more willing to meet with certain types of students than other types of students, and how this depends on whether the request is for today or whether the request is for in the future. So what you can see here is that actually when the request is for today, um, the meeting rates are similar between uh, Caucasian male students and other students, but when the requests are in the future, there's a difference based on the characteristics of the sender. Um, because this is a zero variable cost to the researcher experiment, they're able to send out many variations of this, which is great. So you can imagine all the different conditions that you might want to do, uh, and so they have a variety of different kinds of names and ethnicities. Um, so let's think about what are the fixed and variable costs in this experiment. So to the researcher, it is free to send out more emails. Um, now, but that does not mean it's free to the world. So if you do an experiment like this with 100,000 professors, that is, let's say it takes one minute per professor to answer this email, then you are imposing a cost of 100,000 minutes on society. So in other words, when you think about cost, don't just think about cost to yourself. Think about cost to other people as well. Um, so there's this difference between zero variable cost and zero variable cost to you, especially if these people are not opting in to be a participant in your experiment. So Music Lab, that took sometimes five to 10 minutes, but those people are choosing to be in it. Um, here you're sort of conscripting people into your experiment, and so you should think carefully about the time. I want to point out these researchers were very aware of this issue. They have a discussion of it in their paper, which I think is great. Um, they obviously went through IRB approval. They also debriefed participants. So debriefing is uh, what happens when after an experiment is over, you tell them like, oh, hey, by the way, you're in an experiment. Some people may say, why debrief people? It just causes problems. Other people may say debriefing is consistent with transparency-based accountability. Um, there are a number of debates about debriefing and whether it does more harm than good. Psychologists have thought about it a lot. There's some um, links to papers in bit by bit about debates around debriefing. Um, but I just want to bring up this point about think about the costs on other people if you are conscripting them into your experiments. So I think we, are, we had a bunch of questions already. Are there any more questions? Yeah, let's have questions. Um, oh. I really like Music Lab. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if, you, when you thought about IRB, mm -hmm. you two kinds of participants in mm -hmm. that experiment. Did you also like the recruiting and communication with the bands? Mm -hmm. Is that something you had to think through ahead of time? Yeah, that was all. Yeah, that all went through IRB approval, all the stuff with the bands and all the stuff with the participants. Other questions? Yeah. Hi. Um, so, it seems like in the previous presentation you framed this as building an experiment, not building a 
products. Mm -hmm. um, but it seems like here you're filling a need for the bands and you're filling a need for consumers who like, I guess, want music. Mm -hmm. um, so like in designing the experiment, yeah. did you, I guess, did you design it in a way, since it, it is like kind of a big in terms of cost, did yep. you design it in a way that no matter how it panned out, you would have something that would be publishable or usable? Like, or, yeah, because I could imagine yeah. a scenario in which you were like, did this big cost and then at the end it turns out like social influence doesn't isn't real or something yeah no no <laughs> i think that's a great question so a couple things um one is why i call it building an experiment and not building a product is because we never intended for it to continue to run after this particular experiment was over so it's kind of a single use which also makes it even crazier in terms of bearing all those fixed costs so um I guess to be totally honest, I guess we just all thought it would work. Like the, none of us really doubted that it was going to work. I mean, that was a little crazy. Um, so I think ideally you do want to design um, your experiments, particularly to the extent that you have things with large fixed costs, such that they're interesting either way. Um, I think, I mean, I think we had talked about that. And I think the way we would have um, thought about it is that there were existing theoretical models about cumulative advantage leading to unpredictability. So you know about the QWERTY and Dvorak keyboard. Like there's a lot of technology lock-in kind of literature. That stuff generally involved a smaller number of objects, like two kinds of keyboards, and, and the beta and VHS VCR. Um, <clears throat> so I think if there had been not lock-in, if there had been sort of everyone converging to similar things, I think that would have been potentially a relevant thing for those theories. I think it would have been a little bit less interesting, but I think there is enough disagreement about what might happen that either way it would be informative to some particular theory. Yep. Hey, I was wondering um, on the audit studies, um, beyond the ethical questions of it, do you think the prevalence of audit studies, like I know in political science, everyone and their mother is doing an audit study right now, um, has an effect on people are the, the results you're going to get when um, these people that you are looking to study see the email and say, oh, it's just another political science experiment with an explicitly race signaling name or something to that yeah. effect? Yeah. Um, I think it depends on who the population is in the study. So I think to the extent that you're doing research on people who know about all these experiments, then I think potentially, but most people are not really aware of all of this stuff that's happening. So I think it's probably not a major concern for audit studies that are happening out in the wild. Okay. Cool. Any other questions? <laughs>